Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, uh, hearing to order. Uh, we've uh, been contacted by the ranking member who has indicated she's uh, speaking right now in financial services, and she has given our authorization to go ahead and move ahead. I know she's uh, probably very anxious to hear my opening statement. We'll be very disappointed not to hear it, but uh, <laughs> we can provide her with a copy of it. And, she can <laughs> and, we, have, and we have some of our other most distinguished uh, uh, Democratic colleagues here as well to make sure that if I do anything wrong, they'll, they'll call me on it, so I won't. Um, the Small Business uh, Committee is here today to examine how the current regulatory reform and rollback efforts by Congress and the President have affected small businesses. As this committee knows all too well, federal regulations continue to be one of the biggest challenges facing America's small businesses, and this impacts their abilities to grow. Every day, millions of small business owners across the country are working hard to provide jobs and grow the economy. But no matter what industry these small business owners are in, they must navigate what is often a tangled web of complex, confusing, and costly regulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, according to the National Small Business Association, the average small business owner spends at least $12,000 every year to deal with the costs of regulation. Even worse, a startup company will spend on average over $83,000 in regulatory costs alone in their first year. Small business owners also spend a substantial amount of time navigating regulations, with nearly half of them spending over 40 hours every year to handle new and existing regulations. The evidence is clear. Federal regulations continue to be a problem for America's small business owners, and they need to be addressed. There are federal laws in place that are designed to ensure that agencies do not issue new regulations without careful consideration. One is the Regulatory Flexibility Act, which requires agencies to consider how their proposed regulations will um, impact small entities. Another is the Congressional Review Act, a tool that Congress can use to rescind a regulation on an expedited track. We have used the Congressional Review Act to overturn 15 regulations from the final months of the previous administration that were rushed through uh, the rulemaking process as midnight regulations. Unfortunately, despite these established procedures, small businesses are not being adequately considered in the regulatory process. The President has also taken important steps to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses, such as requiring two regulations be repealed for every new regulation, uh, which we understand is actually quite more than two. I, I've heard it's up to 22 for every new regulation coming out of here, so that's definitely a step in the right direction. And establishing regulatory reform task forces to force agencies to take a hard look at regulations already on the books. And we are seeing results. In the first eight months of the President's tenure, federal agencies added zero new regulatory costs and created over $8 billion in cost savings. That's a good start. But permanent, meaningful regulatory reform needs to come from Congress. For too long, federal agencies have ignored their obligations and inappropriately used loopholes in the rulemaking process to avoid considering how their regulations will impact small businesses. That's why I sponsored H.R. 33, the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act of 2017, which would strengthen the Regulatory Flexibility Act and ensure that federal agencies actually examine how their new regulations would impact small businesses and require them to consider alternatives to reduce unnecessary costs and burdens. This bill was included in a larger bill, H.R. 5, the Regulatory Accountability Act 2017, which passed the House with a bipartisan vote. The Senate's counterpart bill, S-584, was voted out of committee and is awaiting action uh, by the full Senate, as are many other things. I encourage the Senate to vote on this critical common sense legislation as soon as possible so we can provide meaningful regulatory relief to America's small businesses. Our witnesses today will provide important insight into how the current regulatory reform and rollback efforts have been working for America's small businesses. And I would normally now yield to the ranking member. I would assume that my colleagues uh, don't want to give her opening statement, so we will let her opening statement uh, be given at the point that, that she gets here. So um, I will then, uh, let's see here, let me get the appropriate. Next thing here. Where's the, uh, I don't think. Okay. Well, we'll go right into, uh, uh, I would assume that no other committee uh, members have opening statements. If they do, I would ask that they be submitted uh, for the record. 
without objection, so ordered. And I'll take just a moment at this point uh, uh, to explain our lighting system. The ranking member is uh, very familiar with that, so I, this isn't going to put her in any disadvantage, I'm sure. We operate under the five-minute rule. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, there's a lighting system there. The green light will be on for your first four minutes, and then the yellow light will come on to let you know you got a minute to wrap up, and then the red light will come on at the end of five minutes, and we'd ask you to stay within that time if at all possible. We'll give you a little leeway if you need to go on, but try to wrap up if you see the light. Uh, come on, and I'll now uh, introduce uh, our distinguished panel here this morning. Um, our first witness is Karen Harned, who is the Executive Director of the Small Business Legal Center at the National Federation of Independent Business, NFIB. Ms. Harned comments regularly on small business cases before federal and state courts. She has also written and testified before Congress, including this committee, on how regulations impact small businesses and provides compliance assistance for small business owners across the country. Our next witness is Patrick Hedren, who is Vice President for Labor, Legal, and Regulatory Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers. NAM is the largest manufacturing association in the country and represents small manufacturers in all 50 states. Mr. Hedren advocates on behalf of the nation's manufacturers on specific regulations, regulatory reform, and labor and employment policies. Our third witness is Randy Knoll, who is the current chairman at the National Association of Home Builders. Mr. Knoll also founded a custom home building company in, is it Laplace or Laplace? Laplace, okay, Louisiana which has built more than 1,000 custom homes in the greater New Orleans area. He brings more than 30 years of experience to the residential construction industry, and we appreciate all the uh, testimony. And I would ask my uh, colleagues, would they like me to introduce our final witness? Or Don't make it do okay, I'll, it. okay, I'll go ahead and do it. Our final witness is Ms. Uh, Lisa, is it Heinzerling? Or? It is, okay, Heinzerling. Ms. Heinzerling is the, is the Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. She specializes in administrative law, environmental law, and food law, and has several publications on these topics. We welcome Ms. Heinzerling uh, today as we do all our witnesses. And uh, Ms. Harned, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Chabot and Ranking Member Velasquez. On behalf of National Federation of Independent Business, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the positive impact deregulation is having and regulatory reform can have on small business. Overzealous regulation is a continuous concern for small business. The uncertainty caused by future regulation effectively acts as a boot on the neck of small business negatively impacting their ability to grow and plan for the future. Since January 2009, government regulations and red tape have been listed as among the top three problems for small business owners, according to NFIB Research Center's monthly Small Business Economic Trends Survey. And in a small business poll on regulations, NFIB found that almost half of small businesses surveyed viewed regulation as a very serious or somewhat serious problem. Compliance costs, difficulty understanding regulatory requirements, and extra paperwork are the key drivers of the regulatory burdens on small business. Understanding how to comply with regulations is a bigger problem for those firms with one to nine employees, since 72% of small business owners in that cohort try to figure out how to comply themselves, as opposed to assigning that task to somebody else. Finally, NFIB's research shows that it's the volume of regulations that poses the largest problem for 55% of small employers, as compared to 37% who are most troubled by a few specific regulations. America's small business owners view President Trump's commitment to rolling back unnecessarily burdensome and duplicative regulation as one of his administration's greatest accomplishments in his first year. Every president has contributed to the problem of overregulation, with tens of thousands of pages being added to the Federal Register every year. Yet the Trump administration, to its great credit, has reversed that trend, reducing the number of pages in the Federal Register by 36%. For fiscal year 2017, President Trump promised to eliminate two regulations for every new one proposed, but the administration exceeded that goal, eliminating 22 regulations for every new regulatory action. 
the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs Administrator, Naomi Rao, has directed each federal agency to have a net reduction in total incremental regulatory costs for FY 2018. Congress has also provided significant relief by rejecting 15 burdensome regulations using its authority under the Congressional Review Act. NFIB commends this committee and the House of Representatives for passing several regulatory reforms, including H.R. 5, the Regulatory Accountability Act, which, as the chairman mentions, contains important reforms for small business in Title III, the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act. As H.R. 5 requires, NFIB supports the following regulatory reforms that we believe would make the regulatory process more effective, transparent, and accountable. NFIB believes that every agency should be required to comply with SABRIFA and convene a small business advocacy review panel before every economically significant rule is promulgated. NFIB supports reforms that would account for the indirect cost of regulation on small business. Federal agencies often proclaim the indirect benefits of their proposals, but they decline to analyze and make publicly available the indirect costs to consumers. NFIB believes judicial review of RFA compliance should be available during the proposed rule stage. NFIB also supports reforms that would waive first-time paperwork violations, require agencies to conduct more vigorous cost-benefit analysis, in Chevron deference, provide for third-party review of RFA analyses, codify, codify Executive Order 13563, and increase agency focus on compliance assistance. Finally, much work still needs to be done to ensure that agencies comply with existing law and do not view Sabrifa as simply just another box to be checked. Small businesses are the engine of our economy, yet over the last several years, the crushing weight of regulation has used up valuable human and financial capital, which is in short supply for America's small business owners. NFIB looks forward to working with Congress to pass regulatory reforms that would improve current law and level the regulatory playing field for small business. Thank you for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, the ranking member has indicated to me that she'd like to give her opening statement after all the witnesses have uh, testified. So, Mr. Hedren, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Chabot, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the committee, thank you very much. It's an honor to testify in front of you today about the impact of regulatory reform on small manufacturers in the United States. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind introduction earlier. Um, I would like to focus my remarks on three key messages. First, when it comes to small business impacts, it's not just the heat, it's the humidity. Small manufacturers worry about the accumulation over time of overlapping and even conflicting rules not just the big ticket items. Second, reducing burdens on small manufacturers is not about the number of rules that come off the books, but it's about the way the, the executive branch approaches regulation. And third, right now is an ideal time for Congress and the executive branch to reflect on what works and to reform the things that do not work. Today's hearing comes at a very interesting time for regulatory policy in general. Last year saw some of the biggest shifts in regulatory policy that I'm aware of. Congress passed, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, and the President signed 15 Congressional Review Act resolutions. That is about 15 times as many as ever before. The President issued Executive Order 13771, which calls on agencies to remove two regulations for each new one that they issue and to adhere to a net zero budget. And while agencies begin to reevaluate their existing rules with an eye toward reform, new major rulemaking has slowed dramatically. The truth as we see it is that reforming ineffective and costly regulations is painstaking work. And we see care and deliberation as a good thing. But our members are optimistic because of relatively calmer waters in this space, and they're investing as a result. In our most recent quarterly outlook survey at the end of 2017, 94.6% of NAM's members said that they were positive about their own company's outlook. That's an all-time high for that survey. That number naturally made headlines. For regulatory geeks like myself, the fourth quarter survey also highlighted some interesting points. Over a third of respondents said that they spend at least seven hours per week on regulatory paperwork, and almost a quarter spent over 10 hours. Four in 10 felt like they had enough guidance on how to comply with the regulations to which they're subject. Over half need to retain a law firm to help them keep up with paperwork. And at the same time, manufacturers are not anti-regulation. Over three quarters told us that smart regulations are essential to ensure a level playing field. 
Our members want to see regulations that make sense for how small and medium-sized manufacturers work in the real world. And we know that this is a bipartisan goal. Regulatory policy is always contentious, however, because the benefits of regulation are usually diffuse while the burdens are usually concentrated. Some sectors, like our own, bear a major share of overall regulatory costs in the economy, and our smaller members experience regulation on almost a personal level, and certainly to a greater degree. Despite bipartisan agreement that we need to do a better job in this space, we worry that both sides are talking past each other. Rulemaking by its nature should be about finding the right balance between the goals to be achieved and the price to be paid. So reforming the regulatory system is really about putting in place basic procedures to ensure that agencies do their best to achieve that balance. They should understand the parties they're regulating, they should evaluate meaningful alternatives, and they should try to maximize the net benefits of their rules. Executive Order 13771 has been in effect for about a year now, and since then, agencies have issued about half as many significant rule documents as under Presidents Bush and Obama in a similar time period. In fact, last year, the administration published 23 deregulatory actions with estimated cost savings. Through the end of fiscal year 17, the administration wrapped up 67 deregulatory actions altogether. These numbers do not really show a slash and burn approach to deregulation. Instead, they show a more methodical approach taking place through the rulemaking process, and that approach takes time. But maybe the most noteworthy number from last year is three. And that's the number of new final rules with over $100 million in burdens on industry, which is a historic low. So in light of what we've seen in the past year, we believe there's plenty of opportunities to implement further reforms, and now is an ideal time to do so. This committee has done great work this year, last year, and in prior years to propose necessary reforms that would close loopholes in the Regulatory Flexibility Act. This work is critical for small and medium-sized manufacturers because agencies too often avoid analyzing small burden impacts or business impacts, despite the original intent of Congress. But beyond legislation such as the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, Congress should also focus on meaningful bipartisan reforms that may not be explicitly focused on small business, but would nevertheless have an important impact on those businesses by driving better regulatory outcomes overall. The NAM urges the committee to continue developing and promoting sensible bipartisan legislation that will give small business a true voice and seat at the table. Thank you for your invitation again to speak today and for your attention on small and medium-sized manufacturers across the country. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Noll, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the National Association of Home Builders on Regulatory Reform and Rollback, the Effects on Small Businesses. My name is Randy Noel, and I'm a second-generation home builder from Laplace, Louisiana, with more than 30 years of experience. I understand how difficult and costly it can be to comply with government regulations. But it's not just costly for me and my business. These costs also deny Americans the opportunity to own a home. Government regulations account for nearly 25% of the cost of a new single-family home. And that prices 14 million American households out of the market for a new home. I'm happy to report that things are getting better. In its first year, the administration has taken major steps to reduce the relentless and costly overregulation of American industry. We've seen more than 20 significant regulatory changes that will benefit homeowners and home buyers. I wish to focus on the progress that has already been made in reducing regulatory burdens for small businesses in our industry, the regulatory headwinds that still linger, and what steps should be taken to fix our broken regulatory rulemaking system. I would like to highlight one particularly unnecessary regulation the administration has ended. The previous administration issued an executive order creating a new federal flood risk management standard which required agencies to develop new regulations based on an expanded flood plain zone. Builders would have had no way of knowing if they had to comply with the new flood plain rules because maps of the expanded flood plain did not exist. They still do not exist. Although FEMA deals with flood insurance, this would have greatly affected HUD's mortgage programs. Specifically, homeowners within these unknown unmapped potential floodplains may have lost access to FHA mortgage insurance, jeopardizing affordable housing opportunities for low to moderate income working class families. We are grateful for this administration's decision to rescind the executive order, and HUD 
has withdrawn its proposed regulations. Even with the progress we have seen this year, significant work remains to peel back and revisit the accumulated layers of regulations. Let me highlight one of these regulations from my written statement, EPA's Lead Renovation, Repair, and Painting Program. This rule addresses lead-based paint, paint hazards created by renovation, repair, and painting activities that disturb lead-based paint in homes built before 1978. We all recognize the need to protect the health of our children. But this regulation is needlessly burdensome. For example, does it not make sense to ensure that homeowners and remodelers have an easy method to test their older homes for lead paint? Yet more than five years after the EPA said a test kit would be ready, we still lack a reliable, commercially available testing kit. This means remodelers may have to assume that a home has lead paint, which means a more costly bill to their client, which in turn may discourage homeowners from using a professional remodeler, one that's been trained, or perhaps do the jobs themselves and risk exposure to lead paint. We should and must make fixes to existing regulations. But at the end of the day, that amounts to little more than a Band-Aid. We need to reform our regulatory process to deal with these problems before, not after the regulation is crafted. And we need to increase the level of congressional oversight over those agencies. This is the only sure way to safeguard against future bad regulation. Fortunately, there is a solution. Legislation has already passed this chamber that would go fix our regulatory system, the Regulatory Accountability Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, and the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act, more commonly known as the Reins Act. NHB will continue to urge the Senate to take up these important bills. I personally believe enacting the Reins Act is a linchpin to reforming our regulatory process. It restores much-needed congressional oversight to the rulemaking process. Without meaningful congressional oversight, poorly crafted rules often go into place and businesses are forced to divert precious resources to lengthy and uncertain legal challenges. While the Reins Act returns control of the regulatory process to the people, the Regulatory Accountability Act repairs the process of developing regulations and the Regulatory Flexibility Improvement Act ensures that agencies are considering the full impact of a proposed regulation on small businesses. Taken together, these reforms will ensure we protect the environment and our workers while also adding fuel to the engine of economic growth that America's small business represents. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Ms. Angeling, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity <clears throat> to testify before you today. President Trump has made deregulation a central goal of his domestic policy. He has directed agencies to take an ax to existing regulations and has placed strict limits on the development of new regulations. Agencies have responded by delaying, suspending, and revoking existing regulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. All across the government, rules and policies that took years to develop have been put off or wiped out. These rules and policies address issues as important and diverse as climate change, consumer deception, airline safety, chemical accidents, food safety, sexual assault, and more. In a great many cases, the rules and policies have been put off or rejected with little of the legally required attention to statutory constraints, factual records, or procedural frameworks. As a consequence, Federal courts have rejected the administration's attempts to delay or suspend existing rules on such matters as lead paint, energy efficiency, and methane emissions from oil and gas facilities. Two weeks ago, for example, a federal district court in California granted a preliminary injunction against the Department of Interior's suspension of a rule that was intended to reduce waste of natural gas from oil and gas facilities on public lands. Particularly pertinent to today's hearing, the court found the department's attempt to justify the suspension based on the rule's purported effects on small businesses was not supported by the factual evidence. Agencies have also responded to the president's deregulatory agenda by putting off or canceling new regulatory initiatives. Under the two-for-one executive order, the Office of Management and Budget is empowered to set regulatory budgets for the executive agencies. 
These are not ordinary budgets in which agencies have a limit on what they can spend to do their work. With regulatory budgets, agencies have a limit on what they can require private parties to spend to alleviate the problems the agencies have been charged by statute with addressing. For fiscal year 2018, OMB has given the agencies regulatory budgets that are in every case zero or negative. At the current rate of annual cost savings from all deregulatory efforts across all agencies, it would take the entire executive branch two or three years to accumulate cost savings sufficient to offset the cost of just one specific rule from one agency. Under this executive order as well, a reduction in regulatory costs is considered a success no matter how dearly we pay for it in benefits foregone. Consider again the regulatory budgets OMB has set for this fiscal year. The Department of Energy takes one of the biggest hits in OMB's regulatory budget. It must find $80 million in savings from discarded rules before it may spend a single dollar on new regulation, at which point it must still offset each dollar spent with reductions elsewhere. However, according to OMB itself, the Department of Energy is one of the star performers in the government when one compares the regulatory costs it imposes to the regulatory benefits it reaps for the public. The Department's regulations on energy efficiency over a 10-year period produce net benefits of as much as $31 billion. Consider, too, the example of the Environmental Protection Agency. No agency in this administration has taken a bigger ax to existing regulatory programs than the EPA. Yet OMB has reported that EPA rules outperform the rules of all other agencies combined in the federal government in terms of producing non net monetized benefits. OMB estimates from that from 2016 to 2000, 2006 to 16, EPA regulations provided as much as $750 billion in benefits, measured in terms of lives saved, illnesses averted, and environmental degradation reduced while imposing no more than $65 billion in costs. These are the kinds of programs the administration has slated for especially deep cuts. It makes no sense. As for the effects of the deregulatory surge on small businesses, make no mistake, the war on regulation is being conducted at the behest of some of the largest corporations in this country, and its benefits are being delivered primarily to them. In fact, many of the administration's deregulatory actions not only fail to target their savings to small businesses, but they affirmatively harm small entities by withdrawing regulatory protections that would have benefited them. In evaluating the deregulatory initiatives of this administration, one cannot simply assume that small entities are benefited when regulations are withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I recognize the ranking member, I've noticed that uh, I'm one of our former members of Congress here who uh, had a very distinguished career representing the state of Missouri. Uh, Kenny Hulsoff is in the back of the room over here. So, Kenny, welcome. And uh, I'd now like to recognize the ranking member for the purpose of uh, making our opening statement before we move to regular order on questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, all the witnesses, for being here today. Regulations uh, serve an important purpose in the world we live in. From the food we eat to the air we breathe, government regulations serve the primary purpose of helping to keep us all safe. Yet, some regulations, even those with noble public safety reasons, also place an added burden on the public. Most prevalent among them are regulations which place an excessive compliance burden on small business owners. Small businesses face a greater burden of federal regulatory costs than the larger competitors, something that federal agencies must consider when crafting regulations. On this committee, we are here to help ensure small businesses and entrepreneurs have an economic environment where they can grow and flourish. That is why we take very seriously the responsibility posed by the Regulatory Flexibility Act and the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. It is critical that agencies are considering the economic impact of the regulations and paperwork requirements on small firms. At the same time, Congress needs to know what steps are needed to help agencies achieve this goal. Transparency and communication are the key to an effective system of regulation. To have efficient regulations, we must have a strong dialogue between regulators and the businesses before rules are promulgated. 
An open line of communication can ensure that regulations are written in a common sense way which minimizes unnecessary burdens for small businesses. We need to be sure small firms have an opportunity to weigh in on any changes made to the rulemaking process, whether it is embracing technology, working to synchronize and coordinate at all levels of government, or improving communication, it is an important discussion we must have. Congress plays a critical role in ensuring regulations are not too burdensome, while at the same time protecting the American public. It is therefore irresponsible for the legislative or the executive branch to recklessly change or get rid of regulations without thoroughly looking at the impact and the long-term consequences. Although on its face, Executive Order 13771, which says that for every new regulation issued, at least two prior regulations should be identified for elimination, may seem like a good idea. It has very real impacts on the lives of consumers and small business owners. For instance, offshore drilling on our coast not only harms the environment, it leaves small businesses that rely on tourists subject to potential harm and lost revenue. We saw immediately uh, the governor of Florida sending a letter to President, uh, uh, President Trump regarding how opening drilling, offshore drilling, will have an impact on a major uh, industri industry activity, tourism, in not only uh, Florida, but also New Jersey. We must collaborate to thoughtfully produce streamlined regulation for small firms while keeping in mind our ultimate goal to protect consumers and public safety. I look forward to hearing from each of you about how can we improve our current regulatory system and promote long-term economic growth. And I once again uh, thank the witness for being here, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Generally, yields back, and I will now recognize myself for five minutes to begin the questioning, and I'll begin with you, uh, Ms. Arnold. Um, in your testimony, you stated that small business owners are frustrated by federal regulations and that early engagement in the process is key for small business owners. Um, what are the current tools that small business owners uh, can use to engage in the regulatory process? And are your members usually aware of these tools? Right. So um, really, Suprefa, I guess, has provided the best tools in that, um, you know, especially for the significant regulations and where Suprefa applies, EPA and OSHA, there's a chance for small business owners to participate on the small business um, advocacy review panels and really walk the regulators through how a regulation is going to impact them. We think that's a great model that honestly needs to be, um, you know, replicated. We have had members that have done that and seen good results because really what, why we are so um, uh, supportive of early engagement is we find still to this day, I mean, I've been at NFIB 16 years, that the biggest challenge all of us face um, is trying to educate the regulators on what it actually means to be a small business owner and um, understanding that um, they do not have a general counsel if they've got five employees. They probably don't, they may not even have an attorney they could call to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, more broadly, but beyond where Sabrifa applies currently, you know, obviously there's the comment, comment process. We will comment on their behalf at NFIB, and we do, again, have a number of members that will engage that as well if they find out about it. Thank you very much. Mr. Hedner, I'll go to you next. Um, we know that notice and comment is an important tool that uh, small businesses can use to ensure their concerns are being heard during the rulemaking process. Uh, do you believe that notice and comment is enough, or are there still other problems uh, that prevent small businesses from being able to fully participate uh, in the rulemaking process? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. I would first start by echoing what um, what Karen said. I think that this is a it's a challenging issue because with notice and comment, everybody in the country, and in fact, even if you're not in the country, you have an ability to put a comment into the record for review by the agency and later potentially by a court. So that's an incredibly important part of the engagement process. For smaller businesses, however, they're facing a lot of different issues just to kind of get to that point, and one of them is even understanding that something's taking place. 
So folks like ourselves at this table may have uh, an advantage in hearing when an agency starts to act and undertake a new rulemaking that small businesses just aren't really watching for. I mean, they're watching the bottom line, they're investing, they're growing, and not hopefully reading the Federal Register each day like we do. Yeah. Um, so the tools I think that we need and will benefit from are about greater outreach. Um, and SBA, Office of Advocacy, does an awesome job with this reaching out to companies around the country and pulling together roundtables and, and um, helping them jump into the process. But we also need tools that enable and encourage and even force agencies to pay attention to these impacts and to affirmatively go out, find them, and incorporate them into their decision making. Thank you very much. Uh, and Mr. Noel, you're, uh, I'll go to you next there. In, in your testimony, uh, you mentioned the waters of the United States rule as an example of a rule that was deeply flawed but has been withdrawn and is currently being rewritten. What advice do you have for the agencies uh, to make sure small business owners are heard while they're rewriting uh, various rules, well, or, or this rule in particular, actually? Well, it's important that, of course, they be part of the rewriting of the definition of the waters of the U.S. It's a pretty murky subject to, to begin with. Um, but the flip side of that is you need to make sure that, the, that they have access to property so they can continue to have their businesses. Um, I participated in, in some roundtables and discussions about issues like Waters of the U.S., and uh, one of the things from a frustrating point of view from somebody in the industry is it seems that it falls on deaf ears when it comes time for a rule or regulation to come out. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of accountability to reacting to the, the information that they receive, which discourages folks to give them the information. Uh, clearly, Waters of the U.S. impacts the, our industry in particular, and we're having a very, very difficult time getting to a point where we have affordable housing for folks, so much so that most of the large urban areas across the country are beginning to talk about affordable housing crisis that they're having. And a big piece of that was the, that definition of the Waters of the U.S. When you have to go through a 404 permit to get a, uh, a wetlands permit to, to develop a piece of property, it's an expensive and a long piece of work you have to do. So it's very important that the, uh, the EPA listen to us. They've been listening to us. We're, we're, we're real proud that uh, Secretary Pruitt has, has allowed us to, to participate in that discussion. And we think we can get to a place where it works for everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. And Ms. Heinzerling, unfortunately, uh, my time has run out, so I apologize for not getting a question to you. But uh, as I say, my time has expired, and the ranking member is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Professor, when we consider regulations, whether in this committee or when we hear about a discussion or debate on regulations, uh, it, it seems like the focus is always on the compliant costs associated with them. But many regulations benefit small businesses, both large and small, especially when it comes to increasing the productivity of uh, their employees. Can you elaborate on this perspective? Yes, I'm, there is a, a distressing uh, focus these days on costs alone and not on the benefits of regulation. And those benefits can take a huge variety of forms. And sometimes the regulations, in fact, actually directly pit large businesses against small businesses. And in that case, we miss, if we simply take a cleaver to the regulation, we miss the ben benefits for small businesses. So just to give you one example, the Department of Agriculture had uh, been in the midst of developing a rule that would have protected small farmers against the anti-competitive uh, uh, practices of the large meat industry. And that rule has been withdrawn. And that's just one example of a case where uh, we have regulations that not only indirectly benefit small businesses, which I would say a wide variety of regulations do, just like the tourism effects that you were talking about, but that directly are aimed at uh, protecting them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Noel, Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Harvey devastated Texas, where there are very relaxed building codes. In fact, it is just one of four states along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts with no mandatory statewide building codes and no program to license building officials. That has put insurers 
who favor stricter building codes and fewer homes in risky locations against home builders who want uh, to ease rules. How do we balance these competing, uh, competing regulatory demands to protect small construction firms, small insurance companies, and consumers at the same time? Sure, thanks for that question. As you know, I'm from right outside of New Orleans, and we obviously had that issue after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually was actively involved with the Louisiana Home Builder Association passing a statewide uniform building code that was enforced thanks to a great deal of help from the federal government to help fund those, those, those stand-up issues. Texas does have codes in certain areas. They've adopted the, the International Residential Code, particularly those on the coast are building to that. Um, floodplain maps, they comply with that. Um, builders don't oppose building codes. They want reasonable building codes that achieve what they want to achieve. You want to keep a house safe. You want to make sure that the, the homeowner has a place to go home to after a storm. But the flip side of that is to do it as affordable as you possibly can because the, the, what we don't want to have is make housing so unaffordable that they're living in substandard housing that's not built. But, but don't you think that uh, it, will, it doesn't provide a level, pl a level playing field? We're not talking about not supporting uh, rules or uh, codes, but it... it, it uh, eased those rules and for an insurance to take the risk of providing insurance for a construction that might not uh, provide um, a, a, a steady home, uh, how do you reconcile that? Well, as a Louisiana, we passed the code so that wouldn't happen, and the insurance companies were a large driver of that. Mm -hmm. Texas has a, a, a building code, and a, a I suspect there may be some states that don't. I can get back to you on that. But okay. uh, for the largest part, uh, the National Association of Home Builders in particular are very, very active in the, in the adoption of building codes across the country because exactly what you say uh, is the, uh, the the level playing field is not there if you have some people that's not building the codes and mm -hmm. some people building the codes. Uh, also, um, most of our members across the country support licensing of builders. And um, actually, I think Texas has had that at one time, and they, they undid it. But uh, the same thing as you, you point out. Let's 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 have let's have pretty, some consistency so the insurance companies know what their their actuarially risk um, basing their premiums on. Thank you. So um, for the most part, I think our our members would support you know building codes across the country. Thank you, uh, Professor. Do you have any comment to that question? No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, General Lady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Kelly, who is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations. Recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the ranking member. Thank you, witnesses, for testifying today, and thank you, Mr. Noel, for not having an accent. Uh, during my three years in Congress, uh, I have never once had small businesses, and I stay very active in my district and very active with my small businesses, and I've been on this committee my entire time. And not once have I, have I heard any of my small business owners say, I wish you guys in Congress or I wish administrative agencies would enact more rules and regulations. Not once have I heard that. I have heard the opposite of that many, many times. In my opinion, every rule that is enacted should have to get congressional approval and should not be. And so I, I, I would go further than the RAINS Act. I think any rule should have to be approved by Congress. I think we have advocated our responsibility to rulemaking organizations which are not elected by the people. The cost to comply for small businesses are extremely overburdensome. They don't know what rules that they have to. They don't have the staff, the training. They can't afford to hire professionals to do those things, so they become really. Many times, I feel the administrative agencies, when they enact rules, are making regulations or solutions in search of a problem. They don't have a problem that they're trying to fix. That being said, Mr. Hedron, uh, you note in your testimony that there's a record high optimism in the manufacturing ism. Is there uh, is the reduction in new regulations uh, part of the reason for that? Optimism. Thank you very much for that question, uh, Congressman. I think, from our perspective, there uh, there certainly is a component of that. I think that manufacturing optimism is supported by the general regulatory environment right now, and what we see, I think, most no notably in that is there's a, there's a slowdown. 
So for particularly small and medium-sized manufacturers, they have an opportunity to catch their breath and understand a little bit about what's going on and what's coming at them. And before, you know, you may have periods of time in which there are four or five new rules a month that might impact you that you have to learn how to comply with. And while our members completely understand the benefits that those rules may bring, it's still pretty tough to keep up with. Excellent. Mr. Noel, as a small business owner, do you feel like uh, your voice is being adequately heard in the federal rulemaking process through the comments and things? That, do you feel like yours is a personal th or properly heard? From a personal perspective, I've dealt with um, placement of levies with the Army Corps of Engineers, the uh, uh, overtime rule, we, we sat on some, some round tables for those things, and I was, I gotta be honest, when I got the reports, because we participated, they sent us reports, and I read the reports, I was, I was a little disappointed that very little of what the community had said was overshadowed by all these outside entities that had, be, you know, have never been to our area, comments in that same report, and, and that the agency reacted to not the communities as much as they did to those those outside those outside entities. Um, normally, the way a small business in in my industry finds out about a rural regulation is the federal employee walks onto the job site and cites them because they don't have the proper poster up or they don't have the proper paperwork in a file. Not that they've polluted anything, but because they don't follow this list of long list of rules they don't have time to read because they're trying to work for a living that's how they usually find out about it thank you and I, and, I, and my experience has been uh, comments are not uh, properly paid attention to and that in many cases agencies have uh, improperly influenced certain groups to comment so that they can get the correct comments for the rule that they want to enact miss um, Horned, uh, if I can ask you a question as a uh, do you feel like, um, or what, what do you think we can do that would require the agencies to analyze the impact on small businesses better? I, th I think many times they do look at this large business because they can afford to, so it puts small business out. What can we do to analyze the second and third order effects to small businesses of all regulations? Yeah, I think there's, um, this is a, something I've thought about a lot because it is hard, especially with the small businesses we're trying to get out, the tenant unders, because they're busy running their business. I think we need to look at, you know, it's 2018, new technologies, ways to, you know, conference calls. People don't necessarily have to show up for a meeting, but also help them understand, here's what this rule's going to do, because many times they may not even understand they're impacted until after the fact. And so I think we need to just be much more aggressive in outreach, quite frankly. And if there's ways to make the agencies accountable to do just that, that is going to have a better result where you're not going to have unintended consequences with so many of these rules that you see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations, to recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Velasquez, for hosting the hearing today, and thank you uh, to our folks here for your, for your testimony. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Um, Heinzerling, mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. What are the uh, implications for OMB's plan giving agencies regulatory budgets of zero or sub-zero for fiscal year 2018? They are dire. Okay. And I, I think that here in Congress, one of the things that can go unremarked sometimes is that agencies are entirely creatures of statutes. The problems that they address are identified by Congress. Agencies are created by Congress. They're funded by Congress. They are charged by Congress. And so if we have a year in which we're on pace to have no major rules enacted, that means that some instruction from Congress is going unheeded by the agencies. And, and so to talk about accountability on the part of agencies without talking about the vast amount of unaccountability that's happening today because instructions aren't being followed, I think is, is one-sided. Uh, and so I think the consequences are dire both in terms of uh, attention to legal requirements and more profoundly in terms of attention to the kinds of concerns about public health and safety and the environment and consumer deception and on down the line okay. that rules are 
are intended to serve. All right. Is it possible that a very important regulation will not get implemented or will get um, uh, get implemented at the cost of two other regulations uh, that should also stay in effect? I believe it's a certainty. If they follow those regulatory budgets, as I said, there were, there, it's hard to find a major rule that could be achieved uh, within this year, given the level of cost versus. Okay, you know, we hear a lot about um, regulatory, the regulatory environment in this committee, and I know that there are some areas uh, that can be improved, but, uh, and can you just speak to the overlap between the state and federal, federal regulations, and which has a greater impact on, on small firms? I think this is a hugely important question. And I think one of the striking features of many of the studies that talk about the effects of regulation on small businesses is that they don't separate out what are the regulatory costs from the federal government versus what are the costs versus by the state government or indeed even local governments. And many of the costs that we see are actually imposed by those other entities. Okay. Um, and this question will be for any, any of the other panelists that want to speak to it. The, the Paperwork Reduction Act was amended in 1995 to require OBM to set specific goals for reducing the burden from the level it had reached in 1995 and preventing those from growing in future years. But those goals were not met and the paperwork uh, burden continues to increase. So what are the biggest challenges that agencies face in reducing the overall paperwork burden? The challenges that agencies face. Yes, I mean, um, honestly, I I can't speak to that. I can I can assure you though that is still very much a problem for my members. And I would just like to go back to something you were discussing. Our regulation study that NFIB did um, and released early 2017 indicated that 50% of respondents found federal regulations to be the most problematic. We did break that out. State was 30%, local was 15. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Okay. Does anybody else like to respond to it? Sure. Uh, Congressman, I think that's an incredibly important question and one that's actually a little bit tough to get to because paperwork is relatively mm -hmm. less transparent in terms of how it's prepared, reviewed, and eventually sent out to the public as a paperwork uh, collection request, information collection request. Uh, but there are, are certainly cases in which agencies are collecting the same information as other agencies but may not be aware of that. There may be uh, instances, for example, in collecting generalized data about business operations that overcollect, that are kind of collecting data for the sake of it. So there's always opportunity there. And I think what we saw in 2017 is really a lot of the impressive reductions uh, in regulatory burdens came from the paperwork side because you can kind of get your arms around it. Another angle on this, which is very important and which the committee has actually dealt with um, very well with the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, is getting into agencies like the IRS, which have a disproportionate share of the, of the paperwork collection volume. Okay, thank you very much. I'm out of time. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to echo what General Kelly mentioned. Uh, Small businesses are sick and tired of needless regulations, and it has been a pleasure for this last year to get uh, regulations off the books that unelected bureaucrats who have never run a small business, and I'm a contractor, I'm a real estate developer, we're sick and tired of, of people who don't really know, have field experience, and yet they're trying to read a book and pass a regulation. So thank God uh, it's changing. That's why you're seeing the economy do what it's doing, and, and we'll do any greater things. Uh, Mr. Hedger, let me ask you specifically, we've got a company in our area, Composite Resources. How would they get notice of a regulation? Would they have to sift through thousands of papers to see what they have to comply with? And what's the cost of trying to dig through uh, what bureaucrats have, have written to hopefully uh, apply to a particular company? Congressman, thank you for that question. I think to start in reverse order, the cost is time. And in many cases, small and medium-sized businesses 
don't have a specific regulatory official. It may just be the president of that business. So for composite resources, that may be the senior leadership team taking their time to understand how they want to implement something in their facility. And, and in our experience, certainly they, those facility leaders take this very seriously and they will dedicate the time to do a good job. In terms of how they find out when things are changing, it's not always the cleanest process. And as others have mentioned, there's a state and federal dynamic to this. There's a executive department and independent agency dynamic to this. But when you really boil it down, there's no truly effective way to push this information out to people who may be affected. And that truly is one of the core issues at stake when we talk about getting small and medium-sized enterprises engaged in this process effectively. Thank you. Ms. Noel, you're in the field, uh, you're in the business. How, what can we do to get the career development uh, opportunities available that will foster people getting into the business, and what can we do to, I guess, influence that so that we can have our carpenters, we can have our brick masons, we can have our land uh, developers? I'm, I'm speaking a lot in a lot of different venues about trying to change the mindset of the parents across the country that working with your hands is a noble pursuit. Uh, we have so long told our children that and parents think that it's more important to go to a four-year college to be a success in life, and we've got to somehow reverse that. Uh, we, we've, we've worked with counselors at schools. We, we are in a big push nationwide now to put both tech schools classes back into the high schools. Uh, I was in Johnson City, Tennessee recently and watched some high school students that had both tech schools build some things, and it was remarkable, and those children loved it. It's a good pursuit, and we need to change that mindset across the country. And, it, and it's, it, it's going to take a big advertising campaign of some sort to get to the parents to let them know, you know how important it is to be able to work with your hands and, and create things. Um, I, we're working on it as hard as well, we can. And if you can help, please help. <laughs> we'll do it and, and keep up the good work. It's, a, uh, it's, it's something, uh, you know, the best social program we can pass is a job, yes, sir. and by helping people find their niche and doing it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you much. The gentleman yields back, made some very good points sir. I'd say. Uh, the gentleman uh, from Florida, Mr. Lawson, uh, who is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Health and Technology, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. No, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, uh, some, uh, it centers around uh, the BP oil spill. Um, with the regulation that we had, uh, in place then a lack of re uh, regulation had how did it really hurt uh, small businesses uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Louisiana area? Well, the, the results of the oil spill and the corresponding moratorium on drilling that happened, there was multiple layoffs in, in our area in South Louisiana. So there was a lot of people worked in the oil field that suddenly didn't have a job, so they didn't want to build a home, clearly. Um, down down the coast in Florida where the tourist was, the tourism just dropped off because of all the negative publicity across the country. People thought, you know, the, 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 the beaches were near from Tallahassee, right? Right. And were covered with oil, and, you know, it was wonderful for me. My son lives in Destin, and we, we didn't have all the traffic problems. While the, and the beaches looked pretty well. But um, it... Uh, my, my, my understanding, and I don't know this for a fact, but the, the BP oil spill was as much about uh, enforcing the rules on that group of people that were responsible for that as it was anything. But it did have a negative impact on the economy down there, clearly. Okay. My other question would be uh, from the attorney. Um, how do you get more people participating uh, in these regulations that agencies actually uh, making because it really affects the bottom line uh, of a, a lot of different things. Like when we talk about home building, that, you know, people don't seem to realize that it really going to be passed down to the consumer and the consumer won't have the opportunity, you know, to purchase a home. But you see the regulation over and over. From a legal standpoint, how do you get them involved with some of the agencies when they are making these type uh, regulations? 
Well, I think just to back up for one second, one of the things we have to have is to make sure that we actually go through that process that would allow them to comment. And in many of the activities we're seeing today, we actually don't see that being followed. And that means they don't get a chance to comment because there's no uh, process afforded for that with that opportunity. But secondly, to, to allow more people or encourage more people to comment, I think the agencies are making use of social media in a way that they didn't before. I think that they've come under criticism, sometimes from the same people who like to have public comment uh, and like to have the widest range of voices as possible. But they're, they are using, I would say, a variety of modern tools to try to get as much input as possible in their roles. And I have to say, having worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for two years, we did see things from another perspective, which was we saw the, uh, the amazing number of comments that we got on any significant proposal. And we felt our obligation to respond those com to those comments. Maybe at the end of the day, the outcome wasn't what everybody wanted. But uh, we felt it was our legal obligation to respond to the significant comments. Okay, thank you. And you know, earlier, uh, I think Mr. Harden was uh, speaking about the rollback that the president had done on a lot of his regulation. You know, I, I, I've been in the insurance industry uh, for, th for 36 years. You haven't seen any regulation unless you've been in the insurance industry. <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of regulation. Uh, these rollback, when you say it's going to stimulate uh, that we've seen, you know, I've seen them on the floor, uh, being a first timer, uh, the rollbacks are going to stimulate the economy and you've seen it working in the economy now. Uh, how, uh, uh, from your perspective, and I don't have much time, how did the business community respond? Right. Well, we've, I mean, like um, Mr. Hedren's members, our members have been very um, positive about the rollback because it really did for so many of them, so many regulations coming at once, which is how they felt like they were living the last several years, w was paralyzing. And as a result, they were sitting on their their business the way it was. They were not growing. They were not moving forward, and now they do have a chance to catch a deep breath and know, okay, well, I don't have to worry right now about a ton more coming out of Washington at the moment. Let me get the decks cleared and figure out what is going on and 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 that sort of thing, because it really was um, overwhelming. And, and our data has shown since the beginning that has been one of the key drivers to them growing. Okay, I, I have another question, but my time is running out. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. If if you'd like, I, I can extend the gentleman a little additional time, if you'd like. Just a little but different time. Gentleman has another minute. Okay, th thank you very much. And anyone can answer that. As um, a lot of these regulations come down to partisan issues, and you have one group is saying it's the best thing to do the rollback, and the other group is saying that we're going to hurt the consumer. You know, how, how do you respond to that? If anybody care to respond. <laughs> no, well, let me see if I can try. You know, the, the, the parties change in the administration ever so often. You know, we just had a change. The bureaucrats in those agencies, the people that work, not necessarily the secretaries, et cetera, are not changing. And so they perpetuate a rule, and then, you know, that continues on regardless who's in parties in power, um, then, it, then it was all talk about, okay, we're going to roll back or we're going to put more, you know, whatever. But uh, the, the agencies, the, the American people elect the Congress. They put them in office to safeguard their lives here in America, and I think it's important that those same elected officials safeguard that their laws that they pass are being implemented correctly, which is why I think we should have congressional oversight over the agencies in their rulemaking. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, was recognized five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate uh, all of you being here today. I've listened with great interest. Uh, having been a former small business owner, I'd like to speak um, and echo some of the comments that have been made. I, I believe small business owners wake up in the morning and they just pray uh, that that day nobody gets hurt, uh, none of their employees get hurt. They pray that their employees handle any sexual harassment claims appropriately in, in, in the way that they were taught to do. They pray that there are no new, new lawsuits uh, by their customers. 
I mean, th this is the this is what's on their mind and on their agenda. And then they worry about sales and they worry about paying taxes. And then you have we've alluded to this. You have cities, you have counties, you have states, and you have the federal government overlaying each one of them all the things that they think are important uh, for them to do that day uh, when they wake up. A and it's overwhelming. And I actually, uh, I, I guess one of my questions is, and I'll ask uh, Ms. Harned, did I pronounce that correctly? Is it possible that fewer regulations will actually lead to better compliance with existing regulations because we, we filtered out some of these things that they just can't pay attention to? and allowed them to really focus on the things that are most important. Absolutely, I would agree with that because that is a huge problem. As um, Mr. Hedren said, so, or, or maybe it was Mr. Noel, so often, unfortunately, small business owners find out about a requirement when the inspector is at their business. There is just no way for them to keep up. I have friends that are very well-heeled, small business owners, but they say, Karen, I learn about a new requirement every time I see you. And it's because that I do this for full time. They're busy running their business. And I do think we need to prioritize what's most important. What's most important for public safety? What's most important for environmental? And get rid of the regulatory underbrush. I'm actually hopeful that the executive order the president um, put forward last year will do just that. Get rid of those regulations that haven't been enforced in decades. If they haven't been enforced in decades. Why are they on the books? Just for a game of gotcha? I mean, that is not helpful. Yeah, uh, we heard in testimony today that the war on deregulation is waged by big business. W would you address the disproportionate burden on small business of regulation and, and why it's harder for them actually than big business to comply? Yes, again, you know, our research has shown that, you know, 72% of those small business owners with less than 10 employees are the ones actually reading that Federal Register notice once they find out about it to try to figure out what that rule is they're going to have to comply with and how to do so. And so that is a complete time burden for them because they're not an expert on that regulation or those that area of the law. Um, it, and for those that are um, have more employees, they're farming that out, but they're paying significant costs to do so. And so, um, again, not all regulation is bad, but we do need to prioritize and limit how much there is so that we can get, I really do, again, agree with you, we can get better compliance if people know what they're actually supposed to comply with. All right, Mr. Hedren and Mr. Noel, you're shaking your head. Would either of you care to comment on that? Not to. All right. I, it, you know, on the National Association of Home Builders represent 140,000 building uh, entities across the country. Every one of them find out about federal regulations from us. And we have to take pages and pages of regulations <laughs> and rules and condense them down into something that they can digest and comply with. And then when you begin to comply with it, you, you find, okay, the end goal of what the law is, is is one thing, but now I've got to do all this paperwork. I have to literally hire somebody that and pay them anywhere from $500 to $1,200 a house to do the paperwork. You know, and most of our members are three people. So you raise the cost of housing every time you do this. Which is where the disproportionate burden comes on the yeah. small guy, because the big guy can hire he, the lawyers. He's already got the guy, yeah. yeah. Mr. Hendren? Uh, Congressman, that's a, it's a great question, and we represent 14,000 members, of which some are, are larger, and the vast majority of, of them are smaller. And the, I think the best way to think about our members is really an ecosystem of manufacturers. They supply to each other, they compete with each other, they grow together. Um, and at times you might find that when a big business engages in advocacy in the process, the net outcome of that may be that they put whatever comes down from the agency in a final rule into bid requirements, and the small businesses will get the bid requirements and shake their head thinking, I have no idea why they're asking for this. And they didn't see it coming, didn't really have a chance to, to connect with that. But it's, it's a resources issue. It's a... Um, it's an awareness issue, and to to get to your your opening thoughts, I mean, these business leaders do take this seriously. Having an injury on your work site is awful, and people take it personally, and they do what they can to avoid that. But the rules sometimes are prescriptive, and they don't connect all the way through. Yeah, I find with small businesses, a lot of times that injury is a very close friend. 
uh, right? These, these people are family in, in many cases. So I'm out of time. I owe Thank my you. time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, who's the uh, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Workforce, recognized five minutes. Thank you all for being here. Um, I found the conversation very interesting, um, especially since I'm married to a small business owner and um, live vicariously through his uh, dealing with uh, regulations. Um, I also represent a distri district in Central Florida that's home to a vibrant hub of entrepreneurial activities and numerous innovators and creators and small businesses. Um, at, you know, we've created an environment that has allowed entrepreneurs to take chances and pursue their passions in Central Florida, and that's why it's one of the nation's fastest growing regions. But um, nonetheless, I continue to hear from many of the entrepreneurs in my district that burden burdensome regulations have hindered the growth of their businesses. Um, while I believe that reasonable regulation is essential to protecting our economy and public health and our environment, um, I do think, as some of the witnesses have noticed, noted today, that excessively burdensome regulations, while perhaps well-intentioned, um, can do more harm than good in practice. With that in mind, my question to the panel is, how can we better ensure that federal agencies sufficiently understand the activity they're tasked with regulating? Um, you'll find that many of those bureaucrats have never actually worked in the industries that they're trying to regulate. And so while it may be well-intentioned, um, there are quite a bit of unintended consequences. And then uh, kind of the second part of that is how do we encourage agencies to regulate in a way that um, doesn't adopt a one-size-fits-all for um, regulation and um, instead uses uh, approaches that acknowledge that there are differences in firm sizes and sophistication, um, especially as it relates to startups and second stage businesses? I think it would be useful if you don't want a one-size-fits-all approach. It would be useful c for Congress to write laws in that way. <laughs> because many times, statutes don't do that. They take on a problem, even a really important problem, air pollution, workplace safety, and so on, and they don't differentiate among different entities. <coughs> if you want an agency to do that, you need to tell the agency to do that. Because in many cases, there are legal problems associated with differentiating if the statute doesn't allow it. So I would, I would recommend mm -hmm. um, that kind of di differentiation, if, if that's what you want. I also think that um, in addition to, you know, so much of what's in the small business regulatory flexibility improvements are very, yes, um, act, which I think would all be very helpful in that. I mean, NFIB is very supportive of all the provisions in that. Um, one idea I've heard that I think has been used in the UK um, is to have regulators shadow businesses. I really, again, think, and your husband has probably seen this, they just don't understand. And you can't until you actually see a day in the life. And maybe um, there are ways that, that we can do that. I do really encourage Congress to consider these solutions to that are more creative and also will get the regulators, again, to understand who they're regulating. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't think that can happen without somebody having a real uh, personal connection with that person um, and have the small business owner, you know, show them their business, but also really engage them in the process. That's, again, why we are such um, big fans of the SABAR panels and getting those um, for other rules. I mean, the perfect world, <laughs> we would have that done before the regulation ever goes in place. We took a gentleman that is in OSHA to a job site. They had we have to tether people so they don't fall off a roof. And when you stand trusses up, which is the things that hold the roof up, I mean, there's nowhere to, to hook them to. So their, their solution was we build the roof on the ground and get a crane and put it on the top. So we took this gentleman to a job site and let him watch how they put together, and actually this was a two-story, and it dawned on him the things that they were requiring of our guys didn't work. Now, unfortunately, the rule's already in place, mm. so we had to go back and fix the rule. Um, however, Congress can have the agencies involve the people that it's going to affect early on by seeing it on the ground, the better this world will be. Great, thank you. Congresswoman, that's a great question. And actually, I would agree with Professor Heinzerling in saying that 
a big, um, a big portion of how to address this problem is to give agencies the tools that they need in law to, to actually do that. And so this committee has considered several bills that do that. But uh, in our opinion, there are no shortage of ideas in how to improve this process. And, um, and I think that there's more to discuss here. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. General Lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, thank you for being the voice of small business, which creates seven out of every ten new jobs in this country with the work you're doing. is very important, so thanks for being here. A um, couple of things I wanted to touch on, uh, which may have been addressed earlier. Um, number one is the process. Um, we, we took up something called the RAINS Act early on in this session, uh, which I believe to be very important because it goes to who decides. Um, the administrative uh, agencies under the executive branch obviously uh, executing their constitutional authority to promulgate rules, but giving the House of Representatives and Congress oversight over that uh, because we are the body closest to the people. Um, we get to um, consult with you all and hear the real world impact that these regulations are having. Um, I hope that the Senate uh, will take up consideration of that bill in short order because I think that the process piece is very important. But then becomes the question if it is, uh, if it is brought to us, um, how best can we find that point of equilibrium, that sweet spot, if you will, between overregulation and underregulation? We certainly uh, talked about a lot during the tax reform debate about finding that point of equilibrium where you're not. Uh, Rates are low enough so that we're competitive and, we're, and it's not costing us jobs, but they're not so low that we're bleeding revenue to the U.S. government. Um, same with regulations. It's a matter of finding that point of equilibrium that uh, under regulation, which we can't tolerate either because that poses a threat in a whole host of areas, but not over-regulating where we're strangling businesses and hurting small businesses' ability to create jobs. Um, and lastly, if you could, um, for our purposes, identify one or two agencies where you think are are um, the biggest culprits, if you will, of overregulation that's hurting small business. Okay, I'll try that. Um, you know, the many times when there's a problem that needs to be addressed, the stakeholders are in the middle of the problem, want to address the problem, probably have the best answers. It, it's they need to help craft how that rule or regulation goes in place. Home builders t typically don't like building codes, but we passed a statewide building code in Louisiana because we were going to lose all our insurance companies. There was a problem to find, and the builders helped pass those codes. That's just an example of how you take the stakeholders and tell them we have a problem with something and we need to address it. Uh, when I was in high school, you never met a, an oil field worker that didn't have an arm <coughs> missing or something. Well, we, we created workman's compensation programs across the country that do loss control, help people, teach people how not to get hurt because it affects their bottom line when they have to pay more premium because they have an injury. So the more you bring this closer to the people that actually are involved, I think the better the rules and regulations are going to be and the problems will get solved. I would echo that. That really has been something I consistently have heard from small business owners all over the country is that really, um, they don't have as much of a problem with their state regulators because they know them, <coughs> there's, a, re there's a, uh, a relationship there, and they can get to where everybody wants them to be quicker. And I really think um, a lot of study would be required, quite frankly, um, and hard work by the regulators to figure out what all agencies are regulating on a specific issue. Because, you know, just as Patrick had pointed out on paperwork, two agencies with the same paperwork. This is not um, a good situation. That is happening across the government. That's happening with federal and state. Why can't you um, have a situation where if somebody is doing well with a, you know, a state OSHA, for example, that you know, stamp of uh, approval by them, um, no issues, then that means that they don't have to worry about federal OSHA. I mean, I just think there's so much more that can be done cooperatively with the different um, uh, governments, the state and federal, and also just, again, paring everything down um, so that you're really getting um, the priority issues addressed and not just having a lot of regulatory underbrush that, that can really just be used for a gotcha game for small businesses. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in as well. Congressman, thank you for that question. I think um, 
I, I would echo the comments of others and say it's about rigor, it's about awareness, it's about building cooperation and relationship and understanding between agencies and the parties that they regulate. Um, I would probably stop short of picking on a particular agency. We're a very broad group of manufacturers, and I think everybody sort of lives in their own their own environment in that regard. But that's why we advocate for um, for regulatory reform measures that really get to the core essence of rulemaking itself, rather than a particular agency or another. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and his time has expired, and we want to thank our panel for uh, being here today. And as this hearing comes to a close, I would uh, just note that while progress has been made uh, to address the regulatory burden on Americans, uh, uh, small businesses, it's uh, clear that we have work to do. Uh, small business owners should be allowed to focus on growing their businesses uh, instead of spending countless hours navigating through a confusing mess of federal regulations. Uh, I look forward to working with my colleagues to make sure that we provide meaningful regulatory relief and reform the current process to give small business owners a stronger voice in the regulatory process. I would ask unanimous consent that all members uh, have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection so ordered. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.